Assalamu alaikum. I'm Aksa Tariq, uh, the editor-in-chief for the CXO Media Brands in Pakistan. And on behalf of my editorial and conference team, I'd like to welcome all of you um, to another session from CXO Masters Academy, where today we're bringing in uh, CXO crossovers. Um, so we have an interesting session with, with two distinguished um, speakers from the industry um, who've been working in the industry uh, for, for over two decades, and they bring in their experience in, in various fields of um, IT enterprise and digital transformation. Um, of course, uh, you know, this is something that we've also been covering through various mediums, and through our platform, we've been trying to connect CIOs, CISOs, CTOs, and other C-level executives to come in and talk about where businesses are headed um, or what, you know, business modernization is on your agenda. Um, for today's topic, um, this is why we wanted to talk about business modernization, seeing beyond change. Um, you know, digital transformation has been discussed thoroughly in and out um, for the last two years, especially given that COVID has really, uh, you know, brought in a focus on this. However, we wanted to, uh, you know, talk about today's rapidly accelerating business landscape, which has made digital transformation imperative. You know, industries are experiencing major changes and fresh ideas are really the first step towards innovation. So however, um, executing those ideas requires a lot of uh, modernized IT ecosystem um, with the horsepower, agility, with data analytics, um, and the capabilities to do the job. Um, so it really takes, you know, everybody says it really takes a village um, to be able to put that together also when we're looking at large or medium-sized enterprises as well. Um, with this, I'd like to quickly introduce our speakers for today. We have uh, Mr. Ali Aziz. He is the head of IT at uh, National Testing Service Pakistan. And we have with us Samina Rizwan, who is an information and cloud architect at Habib Bank Limited. Um, so thank you uh, to both of you for joining us today and taking out time, um, especially uh, given that it's the last week of Ramzan and everybody's already in, in Eid mode. Uh, but thank you very much for taking out time. And with this, I'd like to quickly have you both introduce a little bit, um, your, uh, introduce yourselves uh, briefly and talk a little bit about your career background. So Alisa, we can start with you. Yes, it's fine. Uh... Uh, as uh, uh, I introduced myself, my name is Ali Aziz. Uh, currently, I'm working as uh, head of IT at National Tech Testing Service Pakistan. Uh, I started my career uh, from uh, as a software engineer with Systems Limited in Lahore, uh, which is a pioneer in uh, software industry in Pakistan. Uh, from Systems Limited, I'm, my second job was uh, with the uh, Ministry of IT. Uh, there was a directorate named the Electronic Government Directorate, which is now uh, called National Information Technology Board. I worked as project manager there, managed uh, some automation projects for uh, federal government. Uh, the major one was the automation of Federal Public Service Commission at that time. Uh, it was back in 2006. <clears throat> From there, I joined the Government of Dubai, uh, Roads and Transport Authority, uh, as a project manager. Uh, I managed some of their IT initiatives, uh, specifically for the uh, licensing agency which deals with the driver's licensing and the vehicle licensing in the Emirate of Dubai. Uh, I managed their uh, new IT initiatives for online services, for different uh, sort of integrations uh, with the uh, banks, uh, with the Emirates Identity Authority, with the ITES centers, uh, and with the uh, one was uh, the insurance companies because uh, uh, to uh, eliminate the paper-based work. So uh, it was done in 2010. Uh, in 2010, we eliminated all uh, paper-based work uh, for registration of the vehicle and issuance of the driver's license in the Emirate of Dubai. Uh, all uh, insurances, Companies are integrated with the uh, licensing authority. No paper-based insurance is acceptable. All data is 
integrated uh, all uh, banks are integrated for uh, car leasing etc because if there is a lease is finished so a customer need to sell it so lease mark is eliminated via the bank system it's not manual so these kind of integrations uh, the projects i managed there one of the main project was uh, we introduced computer based testing for uh, drivers assessment and so, so how has they really helped you shape up what you're doing here today at uh, at NTS because of course you know with governments also and smart governance also a lot of projects have we we all know from the from the public front also that a lot of projects have been worked on um, so if you could talk a little bit about that in your in your introduction yeah uh, let me finish my journey then I'll I'll, I'll move on to this. Uh, from there uh, i managed this project for the testing so i moved from the government to a private organization british organization which is btl uh, uk uh, which is a testing uh, and assessment platform surpass uh, many organizations are using their uh, assessment platform so uh, we uh, introduced a driver uh, that platform for driver assessment in Abu Dhabi, Ajman, Bahrain, in, the, in this region. When I came back to Pakistan, uh, it was due to my personal uh, family issues and joined NTS because I have the background of uh, testing uh, and assessment. Uh, well, when I came here, uh, in Pakistan, the attitude towards automation is a bit different as compared to the foreign countries uh, they actually they uh, they want new things versus in pakistan we avoid uh, new things especially in the public sector organizations so uh, this was my journey and now uh, let's uh, give time to samina to introduce herself thanks then, so much uh, quite a comprehensive journey, Ali. Uh, Samina yeah. Rizwan. Um, I started off my career after graduating from NED. The usual suspect would be to join some company like KLEC, KSE at that time, or Sui Southern, but uh, I opted for a very different kind of a career and uh, was chosen amongst a few for San Jose, and uh, that was PCB designing. And that was a really different kind of a job. So to date, I now can hear that there are certain companies who have started uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, chips and uh, circuit boards. But at that point of time, 1995, you couldn't even imagine that a printed circuit board being manufactured or even designed in Pakistan. So we used to work 24 by seven. So the, the industry was in San Jose, California, I learned a lot, worked on, uh, all kinds of uh, motherboards from supercomputers and uh, microchips and uh, mobile phones were very new at that time and the size was quite big. So, and then I, I had to, again, due to family obligations, had to just quit that job and uh, move back to Pakistan. And this is how I landed into the software region. Being an engineer gives me a lot of pain that why did I leave that? But Change is the only constant that happens in your life. So every day you wake up, it's a new day, and there's a new thing in your life. This is what Anali rightly said that, you know, accepting the change, new things, is hard for perhaps all human beings. And then I started my journey from a software engineer and then a project manager, and then slowly and gradually moved from the software industry into, like, I left the vendor vendor world, joined the bank, and that was Pickick at that time, and then UBL and then HBL and so and so on. During this journey, there there was a lot of change. So one A, I had to leave a lot of norms in my life, in my career, and how I reacted to the change was very important. And this is one thing that I would say that is is necessary 
to step up in order to reach to some other goals because the, each time there's a new goal, each time there's a new challenge, there's a new environment. COVID, you said, no one knew that what COVID was two years back. Where do we stand here today? Like we are totally different. So haven't we already embraced the change? It was imposed. So COVID was imposed. It was a medical reason and everyone was like paranoid and concerned about our lives at the end of the day. So when it's when it comes to change, I changed my career within my career many times. So an engineer, a typical hardware engineer, and then a software engineer, then a project manager, and then moving to a bank, taking leading roles in business relationship management. And then finally in 2013, I landed and then stabilized my career as an enterprise architect, altogether very new in the, in the country at that time, even today we find very few architects. So I always took challenges. That's my long and short of the journey. Wonderful. Um, so I think that that uh, both of you, you know, bring in such a um, such an interesting mix uh, to the table and we're excited to learn about, you know, some of the insights that you will be sharing with us today. Um, so picking up on, on a few points that both of you mentioned, you know, we'd like to take a step back and talk about business modernization. You know, we're talking about seeing beyond change. Um, briefly, both of you mentioned uh, that digital transformation, it's not something which is a new concept. However, it was given, I think, put under the spotlight during COVID for everyone around the world and not just Pakistan or not just particular sectors, but all across. Uh, when we're looking at IT modernization or business modernization, you know, um, this really stands as the backbone for digital transformation. Um, in your opinion or in your you know, career journey, what have you seen as the most typical drivers for business modernization? I think everyone can say COVID for sure, but when we're looking at a, at a business perspective, what would you say have been key drivers? And of course, there could be more than one. No, uh, <clears throat> I don't say COVID as a, a key driver for the transformation. Uh, actually, uh, when I compare um, my uh, journey from uh, working with the government sector in Pakistan, then moved to government sector in UAE, and now back in Pakistan. And when uh, we, uh, I worked on the Federal Public Service Commission project in 2004 to 2006 and 7, at that time, uh, there was no smartphones in Pakistan. Uh, acceptance of going online or using online services is very less. People were reluctant to accept this change that we are going online, we, we can submit applications online or we can uh, work without paper. Uh, we started online application submission in FPSE and everyone was saying, no, we need its printout and signed by the candidate because we need his consent. Okay, he's submitting, he has signed the application. So changing the mindset of everyone from the candidate perspective, from the management perspective, it was very difficult. Uh, when I came back now, when we have smartphones, I rather say smartphones changed our life. Now everybody is using it, even he's illiterate. He is using Facebook, he's using uh, other applications, OLX, DRAS, so many things. Now they are accepting it. Now they want everything on the mobile. Now need is taking us towards the change. Now people demand uh, from every organization that you, you, your system should be on the mobile. Why it's not on the mobile? And when I see uh, statistics uh, of our uh, uh, candidates, how many candidates are applying uh, on the NTS uh, uh, website, uh, the statistics are showing some, more than 75% uh, candidates are using it from Android. So everybody is uh, having the mobile. So this uh, smart phone is changing our lives. This is the major driving factor towards the modernization, towards the digitization. Rather than COVID is, okay, COVID, COVID actually, uh, you can say it, it's uh, a booster for this, this change. 
So um, I'd also like to um, ask you, uh, based on this only, that you know, it's uh, a lot of people or CIOs have also in the past said that it's attached to a significant emotional event. So you know, um, they see aging technology being the driver for all by itself, and as you rightly said, that it was um, the incoming, uh, you know. Uh, emergence of 3G coming into Pakistan, emergence of, of course, mobile phones, social media, and web web or mobile application, right? Yeah. Uh, also, of course, you know, uh, traditional CIOs leave systems in place far past, and of course, you know, uh, business integration funding has dried up. So a lot of these other factors have also come in, or that fear of extinction, um, you know, because COVID has also put that spotlight that we always need to remain re- relevant because um, I think agility has some is something which has been um, no. I think uh, Aksa lost yeah, the, uh, connectivity. Lost so just to um, carry on a little bit on the same conversation to keep it you know, rolling. Uh, you're right, Ali, uh, the, the change in the customer behavior has actually forced us to bring us into that ambit that we need to be not only digital, but we need to be digital with agility so there is a so there's a two speed architecture so when we talk about architecture so we have to be very careful that where are we going to and uh, the customers it's it's more of the customers driving the organizations may it be banks may it be the government organization may it be the uh, consumer industry may it be the retail industry so the customers are the focal point if you talk of the financial industry today, it's no more uh, bringing the customers to the bank. It's the bank that needs to go to the customer. It's the other way around. Yes, because there used to be very few banks in the world and in the country and in the city. How many branches had I seen when I was young and you were young? So only our parents had their probably salary accounts and a few traders had their corporate accounts. But now, Every child has a need, every teenager has a need, uh, even the elderly, the pensioners. So it starts from your life cycle. So how I related that digitization is now embedded and ingrained in our life cycle. So there's a system. So as we see if when you go to US or Europe or Canada, There's always a system for everything. For the transport, there's a fixed system. You need to have a card. Uh, There is a super fine transport system in like uh, Canada or US. So this is how I would say that the financial industry or the corporate industry, they have to be bound to what the customer needs. And you're absolutely right that the need of the customer has driven us more towards being more available. So I take the definition of being digital, digitalized or digitalization is like anyone, anytime and anywhere. So this is something that everyone is inclusive. And if you, especially when you talk of financial uh, industry, inclusion is the key word. So it may be for the unbanked or it may be for your partners and your fintechs. So any, everyone has to be on some level, some page, some system. So that common grounds are digitization. So how do I speak the same language? So everyone does not speak the same language, but technology is the common language across the world. So it could be anywhere. So the XML has made our lives quite simple. So sorry, so we we try to continue the the session. Yeah, you can go to the next. uh, I wanted to... uh, 
I wanted to add on to this, you know, as you, as you talked about technology being the equalizer, you know, back back in college, we used to learn about globalization and how, you know, cross-border communication is now. And I think this this really puts that into perspective that, you know, technology really has no barriers, you know, and that's been an equalizer across industries also. And because you represent an industry which is one of the faster moving um, in terms of adoption, in terms of spending, in terms of, um, you know, modernization of the entire enterprise. And of course, like Alisa earlier said, you know, demand generated. So it is your customers who are driving you to that point that they constantly, they don't want to visit bank branches anymore. They do not want to, you know, uh, go and register um, at a certain point for their testing or their fee structures or other things. So I think those demand driven, uh, you know, optimization has really become um you know very very effective for organizations and i think uh, that's why i'd like to ask both of you about the challenges that it brings right so is it the cio's job or in both of your uh, you know own roles how do you say that uh, how does this relate business modernization initiatives to business outcomes because at the end of the day each of you are responsible for those business outcomes also yes uh, uh... In last year, uh, we rolled out our project uh, for the uh, our uh, automation of our uh, fee payment system. Uh, we integrated uh, real time uh, with the one link. Uh, previously, uh, before one year, uh, candidate needs to visit uh, certain banks where uh, NTS operates its account and deposit the fee over the counter only. This was the only option before one year. Uh, and uh, he has to send us the fee receipt uh, uh, through courier so that we, we make sure, okay, this candidate has deposited the fee. There was no mechanism uh, to cross verify that, okay, this is a genuine receipt. So there were many fake receipts. Mm. So for as far as business outcome, is concerned, uh, once uh, we are uh, live uh, with the one link system and uh, uh, <clears throat> a fee is now, now we have real time uh, updation, okay, this candidate is paying the fee, this candidate has paid the fee. Uh, candidates, there are some organizations, some people or you can say uh, mafias, uh, who manages to uh, stamp the fake uh, bank stamps on the fees. So we faced some challenges in, in uh, fully moving towards the uh, fee from uh, via one link. Now we have uh, uh, completed over 700 million uh, invoices processed during last one year and uh, for business outcome now we are sure okay this project these much candidates are paid that's it not paid or not paid even if somebody is sending us the fee receipt uh, physically we ignore it okay this is no more a valid uh, instrument for us so uh, and uh, also uh, as far as business outcome uh, is concerned we our uh, registration to payment ratio is increased now previously it was less like uh, uh, third more than 35 uh, percent unpaid registrations were there so we may consider okay this is how it is, but now uh, the leakages are fixed via the system and it's around 25% or 10% uh, we recovered, which so is a huge is uh, amount. So this is this is an achievement. So yes. coming get, getting back to Aksa's question and applying it on the financial industry, um, the challenges, yes, they are huge. Because at the end of the day, number one, banks are regulated, highly regulated. Number two, we actually directly contribute to the economic system. 
So it's not just, you know, a part of an ecosystem somewhere and then they are contributing indirectly. It is a direct relationship and a direct contribution towards the economic infrastructure, not only this country, but across the globe. Because at the end of the day, if you see, we are also a part of the global economy. So the challenges for banks are not unique, more or less peoples and processes. So I will not dwell upon these details. Everyone knows that there's a people problem. There, there might be a process problem, legacy processes and legacy mindset that goes without, without saying it. But the main core issue is a combination of these processes and people that we have to be careful about uh, how do we, what is our goal? Is it for a bank bringing deposits or is it bringing just customers? Today, our goal post has shifted. So the deposit stream is continual and that will remain continuous depending on the type of a bank. But when we talk of the customers, that the customers that we have already, are they sticky? Where's the stickiness of the customer? What is the driving force of retaining those customers and what kind of services are we? So there are 38 banks in the country and all of them are more or less providing the same services, free checkbook, free SMS for a corporate client, checking accounts, current accounts, so and so forth. The only differentiator is the speed to market. And in the true sense, when I say speed to market means that I need to reach out to the customer. I'm at repeating customer rarely goes to the bank. Now they expect the bank to go to the customer. So the traffic is all together the other way around. And 38 banks racing at the same speed, same pace. What are the differentiators? And this is exactly Aksa's question probably that what was the driver? What is the driver and what, where do we see ourselves in the future? That's the futuristic vision of every financial institute in the country to cope up and foresee not being prophetic, but at least foresee that what's coming up with the trends. We all know, okay, COVID, we never knew about it, but people know that smartphones are there. People know fintechs are coming. Yes. The regulator knows, and therefore the EMI licenses have been issued. So why not enable more and more people and put banking, financial services as a platform rather than a brick and mortar branch. So this is a challenge that legacy process, legacy system and legacy mindset. Now we are seeing there is a difference because you and I have got another generation at home and we are being questioned by our kids. Okay, what does your bank offer? So my friend's father's or mother's bank offers these things and we get these freebies out of their accounts. So, so everyone, every one of us who are actually working in a bank have to think differently. Start it from your own house. So I need to place an order. I do not go for food. The food panda is there. Same goes with financial services. So there would be a cash on delivery service. So you don't yes. need to go to the ATM. The bank provides you cash at your doorstep. Yes. Uh, it's, it's very nice. Uh, uh, just, uh, uh, actually out of the context uh, from your, uh, my, my kids asked me, okay, I, I asked them, okay, let's open your bank account. We opened bank account. He said, why not this bank? Why this bank? I said, why you want to go to this bank? Because he has seen the advertisement. They offer this thing. They will give us this uh, gift, something for the kids. If you are opening in this account, this bank, they are not giving us anything. What is the benefit? The returns. So it's the awareness. Yeah. So That's it's true. more of the awareness in everyone. Even a bus driver knows what a smartphone is and how can he transfer his salary to his family where he lives yes. in his hometown. As simple as that. Because at the end yeah. of the day, we are working to bring food to the table. 
That's true. Yes, that's so. Sorry, I, I, I caught a little bit um, in the middle about, you know, you're talking about the customer experience portion also. And I wanted to understand or take a deeper dive into, you know, uh, a lot of this comes into change management as well. Um, as you rightly said in the beginning also, Alisa, that, uh, you know, how important change management is to succeeding at digital transformation and business modernization. Today, we are looking at businesses that constantly need to evolve because, of course, their customers come from all social strata. They come from all incomes, uh, income streams. They have to cater to someone uh, uh, at every level, right? But then, of course, at the, at the back end, uh, for people who are designing the architecture, for example, or for people who are heading those IT departments or that functionality, um, it's, it's very important to have that role robust infrastructure also. Um, what are you looking at or how do you see, you know, change management becoming a stronger part into, into developing this constant need of evolution when we're talking about digital transformation? Well, uh, as far as uh, I uh, perceive it with my current uh, role we as a testing agency have to see our uh, prospective clients and customers we have two verticals one are our clients who needs to test their candidates and candidates are our, are our customers who pay us for their tests In this uh, scenario of COVID, there are many, many uh, customers, clients who ask, okay, can we do uh, testing remotely? Can we do uh, testing on the computers? Why we are using paper-based tests still now? Uh, but there are certain limitations uh, as our uh, title is, we have to see beyond change. Uh, what are, are we ready for it? Let's say as technologically, we are ready. We can take computer-based tests, we can take online tests, we can conduct it. But uh, if you take the example of uh, MDCAT test, it was a paper-based test. Last year it was done uh, as a computer-based test, via some other company, it was not uh, NTS. Uh, it's a merit-based test. It's not a qualifying test. There are two kinds of tests. It's a, one is a qualifying test. It doesn't matter if I am getting uh, 80 marks or I'm getting 70 marks, okay, I'm qualified for it. But if the a test is for a merit, it should be same for everyone. In a computer-based environment, you have to test 150,000 candidates at the same time. Our country is not ready for it. We don't have 120 or 50,000 computers available at the same time in 30 or 40 cities connected to the internet, all connectivity available. It's not uh, possible, at least in Pakistan at the moment. So for uh, uh, merit-based tests, we have to have uh, a paper-based test, which is same for everyone. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, PMC, the way I started this also, you know, we wanted to understand about the infrastructure needs also, or, yes. or the architecture, not just internally, but also the external resources yes. required, yes. right? Uh, PMC conducted the MDCAT over 30 days, three tests on a daily basis. It means uh, 90 tests. So candidates are going to the court, okay, this candidate gets easier questions. I got difficult questions. This one, this badge was with easier questions. So it was a mess. Definitely, one can imagine. And so, uh, Samina, when you answer this, I'd also like to add in a little bit about, you know, enterprise architecture also looks at 
um, frameworks and it looks at relationships and policies. And you talked a little bit about, you know, customer experience also in the past, um, but also the evolution or the foundation of their IT stacks, right? So how does your role really support in driving this? And uh, how successful have you been in terms of like change management? Because it's an entire series or entire protocol that needs to be developed and then implemented. Um, and because you also have some project management experience uh, that would, I think, really come in handy here. Right. Thank you, Aksa. That's, that's one of the most important factors for any organization. And I will not correlate it with the bank only because enterprise architects work uh, well across multi-sector industries. The reason and the need of an enterprise architect came across early in like post 2000. So till 1999, things were very, I would say, standardized in terms of, okay, I use a mainframe, I've got Oracle, COBOL, RPG, IBM computers, not much of a variety in technology. It was pretty static, but pretty robust. I would say that we can't even compare the, the commodity service as of today with those mainframes because some of the U US Department of Defense systems are still on COBOL and all those old, old age mainframes. It's hard to change them, by the way. So it started by Y2K. If you see my experience, the whole world, the two digit actually changed the world. It, it forced us to think but no, something is wrong. So it can't happen. So what, what about the century? Why didn't anybody think about the century two digits? Why is it always 79, 89, and then one fine morning, 99? So where's the 220? So 2000 changed the life of the technology people, the business people. Not much of the customers were aware of it. Few of them, okay. I would still be able to get my money on 1st January. Fine, that's great, you can do that. But think about the systems in the factories and in the industries and in manufacturing industries. So these two digits created a lot of, it, it, was, it stirred up the industry. That's the first ever change. Otherwise, having a computer, so we used to study, you know, in our legacy books, old fashioned books. So there was used to be an ENIAC, a, a whole room size computer, and then a mainframe, and then uh, a size of a, a refrigerator. And that's all about it. But these two digits changed the world to think and the economic cycle and, and you know, the stock exchanges, the, the remitting uh, agencies, the whole money cycle, it was turned up and people will get scared to their skin that what would happen after midnight if my clock st strikes zero, zero hundred on 1st of January. So people started working backwards. Okay, change your code. So there was a boom of changing codes to $1.5 per line of code and people minted money. Coming back to the architecture, this is where people then started thinking about foundation architectures. And I, there's an analogy that I always draw when I talk of enterprise architecture is very similar to a civil architecture. So you have a plot and you don't know what to do about it. You just have a 500 square yards plot. You get handed over to your architect. Okay, design me the most beautiful house in this neighborhood. So when we talk about these artifacts so the civil engineer he draws he he draws sorry so i'm sorry i'm sorry so the architects visualize something that you and I cannot see today based on facts, based on trends, and then they enable you to actually, may it be on a piece of paper, may it be on a piece of paper, 
I would say, I'm sorry, there's a slight. So we have to be very careful about the dimensions. So civil architect has to work around the materials, around the sizing and everything around that. An enterprise architect is very similar. So he has to look around the business architecture. Where is the process going? Where is the business strategy? Is it really aligned? So the bank wants 50 million customers ending year five. How to do it? Where's the journey? So the architects actually pave the way for that journey for not only the IT people, it is for the business people. It is for, if you talk of banks, it's for compliance and it is for the customer. So we foresee, we visualize how the world would look like, how the service would look like after one year down the road. So talking of challenges, I would correlate in a bank while digitalization, modernization, speedy kind of a network, yes, Ali said rightly, we, would, we could be short of infrastructure. But mm. at banks, people don't even expect that. It looks like a no-brainer. So the bank should already have managed all this. You know, the yeah. transaction per second, where we're given numbers. Okay, now raise your bar. So every quarter, our bar is raised, not only in targets, but the operations and the security and the infrastructure. So everything goes together. This is the role of the architect to bring everything on one landscape. Just draw a view. So just think about that architect who drew that house. So he asked, is it like a West open or a, an East open house? So now he starts thinking, how do I ventilate that house? This is the actual role of the architect to actually think through the details, the plumbing, the entire plumbing of technology and business services and the customer and the departments and the operations. So it's like one stop shop for all. Um, so, Alisa, would you like to add something here? Because my next question was to you first. Uh, you can carry on. So, uh, you know, um, even, even global research or talking to CIOs internationally, they've also always said that, you know, it goes hand in hand and uh, business, like the, the modernization um, being the foundation for creating a digital business. And now, as uh, both of you have also rightly said that irrespective of what industry um, you're, you're working in, it has to be a digital first business or a mobile first or a web first business. You know, people don't want to look at traditional systems anymore. They want to know. Um, in fact, of course, you know, it's, it's demand generated. Um, so CIOs globally have also said that this goes hand in hand and they can actually feed off each other um, in, in a very, uh, in, in a cycle, right? Um, so whether it is the CIO, the CTO, the CDO now uh, for organizations that do have that role, um, that they are the ones who initiate modernization, depending on, of course, the kind of organization they're working in. Uh, but of course, the CIO is probably the fulcrum on, on which all of it turns. Um, because Samina also explained very rightly about, of course, you know, the role of the architectural team or the, the, the ones who are working um, on that infrastructure development also, or those process management also. Um, how would you say, you know, the role of the CIO has also, also evolved? Initially, maybe you guys were not seen as um, the, the change makers or the business drivers. However, that role has become more and more important, you know. Um, so how would you say that's brought in a change to your role? Yeah, that, that, that's true. Uh, now uh, it is time, uh, at least in Pakistan, that uh, our role is getting recognized. Uh, previously, uh, operations or other business departments they were saying, okay, it is only a sporting role of, for the organization. They support us. Now it is changing as a backbone of the business. Yeah. Because without uh, IT or digitization, now it is impossible to survive. Yeah. So now uh, other departments ask us, okay, we need this. We need this. Previously, we were forcing, okay, please use this. 
Now the demand is coming. We need this. Please do this. Can you do this? So now there is demand from the uh, business side, operation side. Okay, we need any, this. So any, any large program can be made up of a number of, of course, you know, smaller projects. And some of these, you know, might be pure modernization. But if they're well, uh, you know, well architected, they can move an organization towards their end goal. And as you both rightly said that, you know, um, initially maybe business goals were not um, aligned with or that was not your end goal or you weren't directly working on those. However, that's also significantly changed. Um, there is a, a, a greater say or a greater value when it comes to these roles being present in those business decision making processes. Um, my next question to, um, to in fact, both of you would be, uh, you know, what are what are some of the things that we should be looking at when we're also managing progress in IT modernization? Um, uh, Samina, especially you, because you elaborated some of the processes that go into before, uh, you know, developing that architecture. But how do we, of course, manage progress in a, in a world which is obviously constantly changing? As you said, okay, rightly, every, every quarter, you know, your targets have been scaled up for all departments. You need to, like, you know, up the infrastructure. You need to work on all those things. But how do we, of course, manage progress also when we're looking at IT modernization within an enterprise? Right. <clears throat> so if I start for any organization, there is a, there's a life cycle of technology management. And then there is a life cycle of the business management. So when we coincide the two and make one complete life cycle management, bringing both of the worlds together, life becomes really easy because the technology knows where the business is going and vice versa. It should be, it should not be just a demand side that the business is coming to IT it's IT. So this is where IT and technology shops become enablers. So we are no more service providers. Then the next level would be partners, just as Ali said. So there's a demand and there's a supply and it's superb. So the, it's all balanced. So that's the partnering. So the moment I ask IT for some solution, I know it's right there. Now, stepping up a little bit further. How do you place yourself ahead of business? That's the enablement part. You talk of business in their language, but you have that complete solutioning in your background, in your mind, the way you work. So the change in our operations, in our basic operations, that's what I call, should change that we should not wait for someone to come in and bring a demand and place a demand in front of us. It's we should be trend setters. IT people should start thinking in the business manner. They should think like a business person. They should think like a customer. And then they should propose. So this is the legacy. We think that there is a change required and an aggressive change required. And this is what I've been doing. So in the past two banks that we are provoking the business to make some changes, not only in IT. So what we say in, a, in technology, everything will run fine. Doesn't matter this product, that product, all vendors are alike, more or less, because in this day today, I can hardly differentiate between, you know, vendor A and vendor B, product A and B. All of them are almost at par because it's, it's a very high competition. No one wants to be left behind. It's how you fit that technology, how you fit that product. So this fitting cycle. So two years down the road, building roadmaps is a key factor for technology. And of course, every organization has got at least a three year business plan. So just look at that plan, map your business, map your technology plans to it and be innovative. So most of the innovation shops are now also called the digitization shops. They are nobody else but IT people you run across anywhere. So there's this innovation department, a small shop. And all of them are techies, 
sitting in that shop. Who are they? Technology people. But with a lot of exposure. So you need to get out of the box. Think like people outside that box, outside that organization, outside the bank. And bringing their experience, gelling it, making a solution and then presenting it to the business. This is the enablement part and this is how we excel. So there are leaders and there are laggards. So it depends on the organization, which one do you want to choose for? Thank you. And Elisa, would you like to add something to this? Uh, Samina uh, said rightly, uh, now uh, we are the enablers. Actually, IT enablement is the thing. Uh, I'll add here that previously uh, we were having online applications and offline applications. Uh, for offline, once we went with the live with one link system, all our online application fees are now processed via one link. Offline applications, we cannot process until unless there is a transaction in the system. Now, our finance is saying, please, no more manual projects. Please stop it. So now we enable them. Okay, now they can get the reports on a click. Okay, this project, this is the report. So we are the enablers. Uh, we have to uh, enable other departments ahead of time. I agree with Samina. Completely agreed with both of you also. Uh, you know, I just like to add a quick point here. You know, a lot of enterprise architectures, uh, businesses relied on nearly, um, and Samina rightly said, you know, that, that nearly half a century, they were not designed to support a digital business. You know, we were running legacy systems, but as customers demanded, as internal teams demanded, as your business needs, of course, changed, uh, you know, they were not initially designed to support a digital business or the augmentation of, uh, you know, operations with technology. However, traditional enterprise architecture frameworks, you know, we've seen that it also lacks certain elements, practices, and the very technology domains um, that a digital business needs in order to successfully thrive in a digital economy. Um, so with those changing business needs, we've also seen that, you know, businesses have had to step up their game. Um, so, I mean, I, um, I, I did miss a point, but I, I caught on to that, um, that, you know, you were talking about fintechs and, and other organizations also. So when there are these competing or say fast paced business models that are coming up and disrupting the pace of business, I think it's, it's a good call for traditional businesses or institutions to really up their, um, you know, digital or other infrastructure. Um, with this, I'd like to um, just ask if there are any closing comments or thoughts um, or if something that, um, that I may have missed out on uh, that you'd like to say before we close. Well, thank you, Aksa. It was like, um, it's a, it was a pleasure to, you know, exchange ideas and share whatever we have been doing so. Uh, the only thing, yes, uh, as a closing message that uh, please don't consider digitization as something in sitting in a separate room okay it's something we need we need to think about it on a daily basis in every department uh thank you thank you put yourself in the customer's shoes that's all i have yeah that's true we have to put ourselves in the customer shoes but what is the uh easiness we are providing to the end customer yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one more thing that, you know, adding on to this, um, it's, it's been clear that, you know, with a clear IT roadmap, they have a comprehensive view of, you know, future IT modernization projects, and they can then plan resources as well as, you know, the budgets accordingly. Um, finally, I think uh, CIOs or the IT teams have a say in, in business uh, decisions. And I think if that's a step in the right direction, and we're only hoping that this will, you know, um, uh, give more and more space to IT departments to really sort of um, enable business uh, transactions and business processes also. Um, so with this, I'd like to officially close our CXO crossover session and thank both our speakers, Ali Aziz and Samina Rizwan for joining us and for taking out the time. Um, just my last two cents on this is that, you know, modernization can be, of course, pursued for multiple business reasons. However, without the business, the potential of a modernization initiative would be very limited. 
um, and the business and business justification, it simply will not take place. So it's, um, I think, time to take action because the competition, as uh, both of you also said, you know, it's not sitting still. Um, so it's only up to the businesses or the IT teams to really become the enablers and uh, put together, you know, um, their resources, their um, expertise in those certain areas and get moving really quickly because um, as we have all seen, you know, nothing has been, uh, change is, is, has been the only constant. Um, both our speakers here today have a lot of global experience also and we're thankful for, uh, for them to, you know, bring this um, with their insights to this session. Um, so thank you, both of you, once again. And with this, uh, we'd like to thank our partner, Comtel, for partnering with us for this session. And uh, we'll say Allah Hafiz now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Allah Hafiz. Thank you.